Hey guys, welcome back to Reading the Bible in a Year. My name is Logan, and this is day 34. If you're just joining me for the first time, then I'm reading my Bible through this year chronologically. The reason that I'm doing that is to encourage you to read your Bible also. I think reading the Bible through chronologically is a great way to start if you've never read the Bible, because if you didn't know, the Bible is not actually in order. Like, it's not in order from... Here's what happened to here, to here, to here, to here, to here. It, it has kind of narrative and poetry and prophecy kind of lumped together. So if you've never read it before, a great way to read it for the first time is actually in order. So if you want to do that, there's a link in the description of this video that gives you more information. And I made a playlist that's also in the description of this video. So you can watch all the videos that we've done so far. Without further ado, let's hop into Exodus. We're back into narrative. And it moves, this narrative moves really fast. As we saw, Jacob and his family, they were living in Egypt. And the Egyptians, during the time of Joseph, really loved the Israelites, really loved the Jewish people. We see them mourning for days after Jacob dies. They were really, especially Pharaoh, was really appreciative of what Joseph did for him and his people. However, instead of looking at these people as a blessing, they started to see them as a burden. So the Israelites had the blessing of God on them, and the Egyptians saw that these people that had the blessing of God on them were going to be, they were being fruitful and multiplying, and, and the Egyptians became scared. So they started to oppress them, but in their oppression, they actually grew more and more and more, which is a really beautiful picture of what our walk with Christ should look like is that when we're being oppressed, that's actually when we come closer to Jesus instead of farther away. And as we, as you've hopefully read by this point in the first four chapters of Exodus, which we're covering today, M Moses, when he was born, he was put into the Nile because Pharaoh commanded that all the babies be cast into the Nile if they were boys. And then his daughter finds him. So it's kind of like what the enemy meant for evil, God was able to use for good. And Moses, he grows up into this man and, um, you know, he's chased out after he murders someone and he's living in the desert. And then the Lord appears to him in a burning bush. This is the only time in scripture where God appears to someone like this. God, he commands Moses to go to back to his people and to basically set them free that he was going to use, God was going to use this murderous, um, person to go and lead his people out of Egypt. A lot of people, they look at the Bible as a moral rule book, when in fact, we see a lot of people in the Bible that have some bad morals that God uses anyways. The Bible is not a moral rule book. It's how we live with sin and follow God and demonstrating how real people, just like you and me, actually were able to do that successfully. And Moses, when he receives his calling, what I want you to pick up on is how he felt so unqualified for it. When God gives you a calling, you shouldn't be qualified for it. Because if you are 100% qualified for it, you wouldn't need God to complete it. God calls us to do things that without him would be impossible, but with him, they are possible. That's why we, when we're called, we have to pray and seek him. And Moses, his biggest problem that he saw from getting him to follow what God was calling him to do was his speech impediment, that he wasn't an elegant speaker. And that would be a problem if Moses wanted to be a pastor in the 21st century. I really think that a lot of churches would disqualify Moses, the guy that gave the law to the Hebrew people, uh, an, an archetype in Jewish history. They would say, you don't talk pretty enough to be in our church pastoral team. We have a qualification as modern Christians that you have to preach pretty in order to be a leader in the church. And I think that is a massive disservice. We're more concerned about the delivery of the message than the content of it. One of my favorite verses in scripture, it's actually right before the Sermon on the Mount. Is when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He sat down. Imagine if your pastor got up Sunday morning and sat down and spoke to you the whole time. You would think it was weird because we're more concerned about the delivery than the content. Another thing that's so cool about God, whenever he calls Moses, this is what he says in Exodus 3.14. God replied to Moses, I am who I am. 
this is what you say to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And Jesus used that same I am when the Sanhedrin or the Jewish kind of officials of his time were questioning him. He said, I am, and, and meaning that I am God. I am the reference, that I am the Christ to come. Um, and he uses it. So this I am statement is actually a really big deal in Jewish scripture. They um, don't say the word Yahweh. They don't even write it out. That's why Lord in the Old Testament is capital L-O-R-D, Lord. So it's not like a Lord in that time would be like someone that you would serve. So like they're way up here and you're down here and you serve them as your Lord. But the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Lord was was God. And they didn't even say his name. And then this is how God makes himself known to the people. He says, God said, God said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And you know, after just reading the story of Jacob, you would be thinking that he's going to say the God of Israel, the God of the guy that was changed in the wrestling match, the God of the guy that was transformed, the God of the guy that became the father of, of the 12 tribes of Israel. But instead, he says, Jacob, God is the God of our good side and our bad side. He's the God of all of us. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So God is not ashamed of your bad side. In fact, he paid a big price to fix it. So thanks so much for watching. That's all I have for you today. Tomorrow we'll be continuing our journey through Exodus. If this video helped you out, then make sure to leave a like or subscribe to show your support. See you tomorrow.